Today's episode was sponsored as a gift for Sebastian from his girlfriend. So, thank ah. Thank you so much, you guys, and let's go ahead and get this bad boy up on the wall, shall we? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, here it is, up on the wall, MCS, my, my, my chemical Sebastian. Uh, although, actually, I think that the C is what stands for Sebastian here, because in, in the email, Sebastian was spelled with a C. I guess that the reason behind the gift is that the two of them watch my videos together and while I think that's cool and I love the idea that I'm helping bring couples together, I, I do want to point out that um, if you are watching it together that probably only counts as one view for me. So uh, while I do want you guys to still watch it together, I do ask that like every time you watch it, you also go to another computer somewhere else and just press play and let it run so, so, so that my view count goes up. And honestly, everyone, even if you watch it alone, you should, you should be doing that. That would help me out a great deal. But seriously, thank you guys so much for your sponsorship. It means the world and it lets me keep doing this, so thank you. And with that out of the way, let's begin. Hello, nitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, Nitkalis. And if you've been following my channel, then you know that I've been making videos about bad movies for a while now. I've been doing it so long, in fact, that I feel like I've developed a pretty good understanding of what kind of movies I like to talk about, and more importantly, what kind of movies do well. And of all the different subgenres, of all the different bad movies I've ever discussed on here, there's one kind that I keep coming back to more than any other, and that's Christian movies. I don't know what it is, but something about a bad Christian movie just hits differently. They're like a perfect combination of cheap, stupid, and over the top, and more often than not, they're so morally repugnant to me that I don't even feel bad talking shit on them. I never don't enjoy talking about Christian movies, and so I've decided to make a concerted effort to try and talk about them more. And that, coupled with the fact that I have this sweater that I like and never get to wear, has led me to the creation of my newest series, Christian Cinema Corner. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna call it Triple C for short. If I ever do another one of these, which with me is honestly a pretty big if. Although, although I did invest in a new tiny hat, so I feel, I feel like I'll do it at least once more to justify this. When I got the idea to make videos about Christian movies, the first movie I wanted to talk about was obvious. Because it was the movie I was watching when I got the idea. So The other night, I was scrolling through the faith-based section of Tubi, as I often do because my life is a waste, and as I was doing so, I came across a movie called Allison's Choice, which was absolutely insane in literally every way. It tells the story of a young Christian girl's journey through an abortion clinic as she struggles with the decision of whether or not to bring her pregnancy to term. And like, if that sounds like an awful setup for a movie, then just know that it is, but it's awful in ways that you probably wouldn't expect. Before I can go into that though, I feel like I should probably tell you guys a little bit about my own personal views on abortion so you can frame this video and know whether you want to keep watching it or if you should just say something mean about my face in the comment section and leave. 
And I guess that the simple answer is that I'm for it. Uh, I think that bringing a baby into the world is a huge undertaking, and it's really unfair to make someone do it if they don't super want to. Still, while I would definitely consider myself pro-choice, I do get where the other side is coming from. I mean, I don't particularly agree with them, but I do get it. Hey, the way I see it, there are two ways to look at the situation. Either life begins at conception and abortion means murdering a baby, or it doesn't. And for me personally, I don't think that it does. I think that there's a long process before a sperm and an egg becomes a person. And telling someone that they don't have the right to stop that process before it's too late feels like a pretty clear encroachment on their autonomy to me. Although that said, I will fully admit that I didn't always view things that cleanly. I think I've probably always been pro-choice, but I did used to be a lot more hesitant about it than I am now. Like before, my thought process was more, I don't really know when a person becomes a person, but I do know that people's bodies are being regulated against their wills, so I'm just gonna defer to them and hope that they know what they're doing. If that makes sense. I would never argue against someone's right to choose, but I did kind of always have a worry in the back of my head that one day my views would change, and I'd look back on the fact that I was pro-choice once with extreme regret. Unsurprisingly, I've never spent a lot of time researching what aborted fetuses look like or anything like that, and I think that part of me thought that one day I would see one up close and be like, Oh god, it has fingers, and then it would become instantly clear to me that everything I thought I supported was actually very barbaric, and I'd spend the rest of my life picketing Planned Parenthoods, trying to make up for the time I spent supporting it. Thankfully though, that never happened. Like I said, my views evolved in the other direction, and this may sound weird, but I think that started when one of my friends had a baby for the first time. For one thing, it was one of the first instances that I was ever around someone who was gestating anything, and seeing what she went through in order to give birth was an important reminder of how hard pregnancy is, and that nobody should be forced to go through it if they don't want to. More than that though, when she actually gave birth, it was the first time I ever met a newborn, and as I stared into that child's big beautiful eyes, all I could think was... Oh yeah, abortion should definitely be legal. Don't get me wrong, I love that kid with my entire heart and soul, but those first couple of times I met it, it barely felt human to me. It looked like an alien, it couldn't really do anything on its own, and its eyes may have been big and beautiful, but it was clear that there was not a single thought behind them. And like, to be clear, this is not me advocating for some form of postnatal abortion or anything like that because, well, that would obviously be murder, but based on what I saw of that newborn, I feel very confident in saying that were you to knock a trimester or two off of its development, it would not register to me as a person in any way, regardless of how many fingers it may have. And obviously, not everyone feels the same way about this issue that I do, and like I said, I do get where they're coming from. I will fully admit that there are times when I see people protesting abortion and think like, well, yeah, if they really do believe that they live in a world where babies are being legally murdered left and right, then that's what they should be doing because, well, controversial opinion here, but baby murder is bad. Honestly, even though their views are slightly closer to my own, I feel like the anti-choice people I disagree with the most are the ones who say that abortions should be illegal, but also think that there should be certain cases where there are exceptions, because... I don't know, I feel like if your argument truly is that it's killing babies, then you shouldn't then turn around and be like, but here's when I think that should be allowed. And like, don't get me wrong, I think it makes sense why some people would have those exceptions because the circumstances that they occur tend to be pretty horrific, but I feel like thinking about things like that kind of undercuts just how horrific it can be for someone to give birth against their will, 
under any set of circumstances. I feel like it should either be allowed or it shouldn't. So when people, most of whom are politicians, try to find some happy medium on the issue, it does feel kind of weird to me. It either means that in their mind, something horrific is going on and they're willing to occasionally overlook it in order to make themselves look good, or more likely that they don't genuinely believe that abortion is the same as taking a life, but they're still willing to regulate someone else's body most of the time for their own political gain. And right now, I feel like I'm starting to sound more sympathetic to the staunchly pro-life side of the argument than I intend to, so I do want to reiterate that I do not agree with them in any way. I just get where they're coming from. And honestly, even though I get where they're coming from, that doesn't mean that I think what they're saying makes sense most of the time. Generally speaking, the people who are saying that they want to end abortions are the same people arguing against stuff like contraception and sex education. And you'd think that if they were truly against abortions, they'd be in favor of those things, because that's how you prevent them. Honestly, even though this is an extremely polarizing issue, I feel like we should all be on the same side for like 99% of it, because realistically, nobody wants to be getting an abortion. Uh, like even for people with absolutely no moral objection to it, it's still one more thing that they have to do that day. I think in a perfect world, we'd all agree that we should at the very least be working together to try and combat unplanned pregnancies, but if anything, the pro-life crowd makes things way worse in that regard, and I honestly think that's because a lot of them aren't so much against abortion as they are against the idea that we live in a world that's complicated enough that abortions are a thing that someone might possibly need. And I'm gonna be saying a lot about religion in this video, so I do wanna take a moment up top to say for the record that I'm not actually against it. I think it works for a lot of people, and I'm a staunch supporter of whatever works. That said though, I do think that the nature of religion attracts a certain type of person who more than anything is just looking to not have to think too much about shit. And I feel like it's those people, more than religion itself, that are currently ruining the earth as we know it. They don't want to live in a world that's complex, so when they're confronted with one of the complexities of the world, rather than engaging with it, they kind of just close their eyes and cover their ears and go la 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 la. Nope. That's not how things are supposed to be. It's a very simplistic view of the world, and in order to preserve that view, they ironically end up resorting to some very convoluted ways of thinking. And that actually leads me nicely into this movie, because Allison's choice is pretty much just an hour and a half of this kind of thinking. It all begins in a parking lot, where our protagonist is being pressured into sex by her fuckboy of a boyfriend. Can't believe you don't trust me. It's not that I, I don't trust- take any chances. Come on, just for a minute. Oh god. What's with the oh god? I hate that oh god thing you do. I'm sorry, it's just- What is it? You don't love me? And I'll be honest, the first time I watched this, I was kind of surprised that this is how it started, because it kind of felt like the movie was saying that unplanned pregnancies are often complicated situations that aren't as cut and dry as the people who promote abstinence and shit often want to make them seem. I almost turned it off there and then, because it seemed to me like there may have been an ounce of nuance at play here, and nuance is not the reason I tune into Christian movies. Thankfully, though, I stuck it out long enough to see that this movie is about as nuanced as a baked potato, and now looking back on this first scene, knowing what comes after it, I feel like the intention here is less to show the complexity of the situation, and more to make it crystal clear to the audience that our protagonist never wanted to have sex. The movie wants us to believe that Allison is ultimately a good and virtuous woman, and I honestly don't think that the people making this think that she could still be that if she in any way enjoyed sex, so they had to show us a scene of her being coerced. And that's kind of the thing that you need to keep in mind about this movie. There are a lot of times where it feels like it's presenting a surprisingly two-sided depiction of abortion, but I don't think that that's ever intentional. There are a lot of times when they would present a pro-choice agenda in a way that, to me, didn't feel over the top, and I was always kind of surprised by it, but 
Then I would keep thinking about it a little longer and start to realize that, like, actually, no, I think that that was supposed to seem over the top. It just didn't translate to me personally. Like, I kind of get the sense that the people who made this movie are so deeply convinced that they're right that literally any argument that goes against the idea that life begins at conception seems comically absurd to them, and... Because of that, I did sometimes come away feeling like a lot of the subtext of what I watched was lost on me, just by virtue of the fact that I don't view the world through the eyes of a pro-life evangelical Christian. But yeah, Allison does the nasty, gets knocked up, and decides to have an abortion. Or, or rather, I think that the implication here is that her boyfriend convinces her to have an abortion because... Well, despite being called Allison's Choice, this movie doesn't really seem all that interested in letting its protagonist have any agency. She drives herself because her boyfriend sucks, and she goes into the clinic where she's so overwhelmed that the mere act of filling out some paperwork causes her to disassociate. Allison? Allison? Hmm? Done with your paperwork? Ah. Uh. See, um, I, I wasn't sure what to put here about the father. Just put a line through, it doesn't matter. Well, then why include it? I'm sorry, that was less a criticism of this movie than of the American healthcare system in general, but when I think about the time I've wasted filling out unnecessary questions on intake forms, it does make me mad. Um, I just don't want anyone... I mean, it's not like I don't know who it is. We're actually planning on having a family. Just leave it blank. It doesn't matter. Girl, leave it blank. See me? I always leave it blank. If he ain't here with you, he's a blank. They all blank, so you might as well just go on and go blank. Or you can write something more colorful. That's it. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing about this movie. It's weirdly racist. And honestly, I feel like me saying that is kind of complicated, because that is obviously an actress of color, so for me to imply that her performance is racist does make me feel hinky, because... Well, for one thing, I honestly think she kind of crushes it. She is easily the best actress in this entire film. Still, though, I think that she makes the most of what she's been given, when I actually listen to the words that she's been given, it does start to feel a little bit questionable. I know who wrote and directed this movie, it's this dude right here, and when I picture him hunched over his laptop typing out dialogue like this... The creature at the spiller goes, everyone who come around asking her business. I didn't know you from nowhere, girl. But now, since we sisters and all... Uh... It does lead me to believe that he's never actually met a black person in his entire life. Also, despite the fact that there are no Asian people with speaking roles here, there are at least two moments that felt weirdly anti-Asian, so... Yeah, not entirely sure how they managed that, but I will point them out to you as we go. Okay, you intend to pay cash? Oh, yeah, um, I have her right here. She's a first-timer, Miss Glow. Girl, you ain't gotta pay. Tell her. Here, let me just give you this. And you hold on to this and I'll let you know. Wait, so is that lady making a joke? It seems weird to me that the receptionist at an abortion clinic would be trying to pull the patient's leg, and frankly, as a character, Miss Glow doesn't really strike me as a kidder, but I honestly don't know what that clip would mean otherwise. My hunch is that the reason that little exchange is in there is to fire the audience up by letting them know that people don't even have to pay for their legalized baby murders, but when you look at it within the context of the movie, it's honestly just extremely odd. Like, Miss Glow asks for payment, and then the lady in the chair says that Allison is new and doesn't know that she doesn't need to pay, and then when Allison goes to give Miss Glow a card, she refuses it as though, like, yeah, she wasn't being serious when she asked for payment. Based solely on what the movie shows us, it very much seems like this lady is stoically razzing the newbie with one of the weirdest pranks that I have ever seen in my life. After... whatever that was, Allison starts to go back to her seat, but the receptionist stops her and asks her a little question. Allison. Mm -hmm. Uh... 
I could lose my job for asking you this. But are you sure about what you're doing? No. In case you didn't realize it, Ms. Glow is supposed to be a good guy. She can sense that Allison doesn't really want to go through with the procedure, and so she sort of does what she can to fight against it. Not only does she have the balls to ask questions, even if it means she might lose her job, but after that exchange, she switches Allison's appointment to the back of the line, allowing her more time to make the right decision, and unfortunately prolonging the runtime of this movie. And honestly, it's characters like her that make it very hard for me to actually believe a lot of pro-life people when they say that they believe that a fetus is the same as a human life. I think we are very much supposed to empathize with the receptionist and see her as one of the good guys, but like... That shouldn't be. If the people making this movie really believe that abortion is as bad as pro-lifers say that it is, then... Whatever small act she does to ensure that Allison doesn't go through with it should not make up for the fact that she willingly works at the baby murder factory. Honestly, even her good deed shouldn't seem all that good to them. She switches Allison's name with someone further down the list, so really all she's doing is making sure that Wendy's baby dies sooner. I guess that maybe... You could argue that this character is an extremely subtle portrayal of the banality of evil, but I don't think that this movie is that deep. I think the much more likely answer is that this character is meant to show that abortion is so universally hated that even the people who work in the clinics want to stop it. But if that's what they're going for, then those people working in the clinic should still come off as evil, because from their perspective, they would be regardless of how many inappropriate questions they ask. Also, I call bullshit on that entire exchange. I feel like that whole part about her saying she could lose her job was designed to rile up the audience, like they'd fire someone just for asking questions, but I don't even think that's true. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that most states require that the clinic ask the patient if they're sure. It just probably doesn't happen in the waiting room. I wouldn't be surprised if this whole exchange was a reference to an actual thing that happened where a receptionist in the real world lost their job for asking a patient if they were sure, and it's like, yeah. They probably got fired for the same reason they get fired if they gave the patient a rectal examination. It's inappropriate for them to do it because it's not their job. Allison goes back to her chair and waits for her name to be called, and as she does, we get this weird sequence of voiceover. Allison, I have loved you since before your days began. I loved you with a love that is everlasting, with faithfulness and desire for your goodness beyond your furthest dreams. I have a future and a plan for you, Allison. It would melt your heart to know even the tiniest measure of care and wonder that lie before you within the embrace of my hope. And I will never leave you, Allison. As so many have, I will never abandon or turn you away. And I love you, Allison. I love you. I love you. I love you. Do you guys think he loves her? I know that's supposed to be hopeful god talk and shit, but if you showed me that clip in a vacuum, I would 100% assume it was from a horror movie, because it all felt just a wee bit stalkerish to me. It doesn't help matters that the disembodied voice is soon given a body in the form of the clinic's janitor. And like I said earlier, he's played by the guy who wrote and directed this movie, so clearly the dude wanted this role, but... I don't know, I feel like he maybe should have done a round of casting instead because he has a very intense energy. Excuse me, miss. Hmm? May I? Oh, yeah, sorry. No, no, just... Oh, <laughs> right, sorry, I'm, I'm a little new at this. 
Yeah, I know. Okay, if Allison really wants to choose life, she will get away from that man immediately. Also, I feel like they're laying it on a bit thick that this is Allison's first time at the clinic. Uh, like just because this is her first time getting an abortion, that doesn't mean that she shouldn't know when to lift her feet. Honestly, the movie mentions the fact that this is Allison's first time so much that it does make me think that the people making it believe that that is unusual in some way. Based solely on the fact that the lady from before was on a first name basis with the receptionist, I kind of get the sense that the people making this think that there are certain women out there who treat Planned Parenthoods like a hair salon or something, you know? Just like... Just like a place that they go to hang out in once a month when they need a touch-up. I didn't get your name before. You didn't ask before. Yeah, I, I know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just a little new at this. <laughs> First time. See, I knew it. As most teenage girls would do in her situation, Allison quickly opens up to the strange older man that she met at the abortion clinic. She opens up so much, in fact, that she ends up going on this bizarre rant that culminates in her dropping her phone. Yeah, <laughs> that girl over there, she's a first-timer glow. I guess I just have a stamp on my head, right? No, it's not that. Well, I'm a last-timer too, I guarantee it. I would think that's a good thing. Oh, wow. Huh. That was pretty stupid what I just said, huh? Yeah. I'm so sorry how embarrassing. I'm not usually this weird. I'm just, I mean, all I have to do is lift up my feet. But no, not Allison. You know, she's got to turn this whole major thing. Oh, oh my God. Let me get that. Is it okay? Can, can you fix it? What do you mean, can he fix it? The battery just fell out. How bad is this girl with technology that she thinks it might be broken? Although I guess in her defense, she's a little bit on edge about her phone because she's still waiting to hear back from her terrible boyfriend. So when the janitor does inevitably fix it and she sees that he never tried to call, she goes outside to try and call him instead. Nobody home, leave a message. Uh, hi, um, I guess you're still sleeping. That's good, uh, you need your sleep, I'm, I'm glad. Uh... Oh my God, dump his ass. What the fuck kind of D-bag sleeps through their girlfriend's abortion? Honestly, the movie is unintentionally making a pretty strong case in favor of choice right now, because nobody on Earth should ever be forced to raise a kid for the rest of their life with somebody that shitty. Unsurprisingly, though, I don't think that's the argument they're going for here. As best as I can tell, the movie seems to think that it is exactly because the boyfriend is so shitty that Allison should have his baby. Yeah. The janitor follows Allison outside, which... creepy, and after hearing her phone call, he decides to let her know that she deserves better. Is sleeping. At least I hope he's sleeping. Yeah, it's not nice. But you know, you could end up with that guy. It's not a good thing. Better you find out now. A lovely young woman like yourself deserves a guy who will treat her like a lovely young woman like yourself. Okay, I'm sorry to harp on this point, but I really think that Allison should be doing everything in her power to get as far away from this man as she can right now. She's currently alone and vulnerable in a new place, and so far he's followed her into a parking lot, eavesdropped on her phone call, and tried to get her to break up with her boyfriend by telling her how special she is. Granted, we do later find out that he's actually an extremely good guy, to say the least, but based on his actions right now, Allison should at the very least be suspicious of him. Of course she isn't though, instead she just opens up to him some more, and in doing so, she accidentally admits that she's not sure if she wants to go through with this. You've probably met a million girls just like me. And then some. Every one of them special, every one of them precious. 
And every one of them facing the exact same question. What do I do now? So if I have a choice. Oh, well. Tell me I didn't just say that. I wish I could. But you know what I mean? I, I don't have a choice. Like, what else can I do? How about have a baby? And given that that speech comes on the heels of the janitor saying that she deserves better, I'm pretty sure that the implication here is that since Allison's boyfriend sucks, and since Allison's boyfriend is the one telling her that she shouldn't have the baby, that means that Allison should have the baby. Which is a very weird argument. And what makes it even weirder is the fact that it is also an inherently pro-choice argument. Like, she literally just said choice. And this part is honestly kind of insidious, because it's presenting a very specific situation and using it as proof of something much broader. It's at this point that they make it really explicit that Allison is only going through with the procedure because her boyfriend wants her to. That's crazy. I can barely take care of myself. I mean, I, I want to have kids. It's, it's not like I'm against it. It's just, it's not the right time, I guess. Especially with Rick. That's his name, Rick. I already told you that. If we were going good, maybe, but... He just keeps telling me to do this. That everything will be good again if I just do this. And it's like, yeah, that's fucked up. Allison is clearly in a gross relationship, and she needs to learn how to stand up for herself a little bit more, but... That doesn't then mean that all people should not be allowed to regulate their own bodies. Call me a cuck, but I do think that the subtext here is pretty sexist, because it feels like the movie is saying that women don't actually know what's best for them. Only this creepy janitor does, apparently. They may say they want the right to choose, but actually their judgment is so clouded by pressures from society and men and all that jazz that their feeble little minds don't realize that what they actually want is to have tons and tons of babies. After that back and forth with the janitor, Allison gets some advice from someone with, well, actual training in the form of her abortion counselor, Marta. Never fear, Marta's here. My name is Marta. M-A-R-T-A. -A. Marta's my favorite character. Although that said, she was also a very confusing character to me. She's a prime example of a time when I felt like I was missing some major subtext of this film by virtue of the fact that I'm not pro-life. I get the sense that Marta is supposed to come off as a bit of a caricature. She says words like preggers and has a silly way of talking sometimes. The receptionist, a Gloria, she called me about you. She said you're not so sure about that all this today. I thought I was, but I don't know anymore. I've been there myself, girl. But then she also just seems genuinely competent and makes a bunch of pretty good points in favor of Allison going through with the procedure that all feel fairly antithetical to what I think this movie is going for. I just need to buck up and do it. That's what my father always told me, you know? Stop your whimpering, Allison, and just get on with it. No, you don't have to get on with it. Nobody's forcing you. But a young girl like you, you have your whole life ahead of you. As a matter of fact, I was in your shoes once. That's what makes me so qualified for this job. And I love my job. I was about your age, and I never thought I'd get preggers. And my boyfriend wasn't taking responsibility. Is his name Rick, too? No, but sometimes they're all the same, aren't they? I hope not, otherwise I'm in big trouble. So wait, you did this? It's the best thing I ever did. If I saw that clip on its own, I definitely wouldn't guess that it came from a pro-life Christian movie. And the only way I can make sense of it in the context of the rest of the film is to assume that Marta is supposed to read as entirely silly in a way that she honestly just doesn't to me. Like, I think what they're doing here is having her say a bunch of valid stuff. And then I married the most 
wonderful man, also not named Rick. And we had another child. Wait, I mean a child. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, and oh, uh, here he is. I mean, he's all grown up now, but I like to keep him a little boy. It's a mom thing. <laughs> and obviously, I love my job because I get to help girls like you find their way. I always thought if you did this, your plumbing got too screwed up to have another kid. No. Ah, that's pro-life propaganda. Well, I mean, sometimes it does happen. I mean, there are risks, but there are risks to carrying a pregnancy to term two. And then undercutting the validity of that stuff by having her say weird kooky stuff. Like, I feel like the audience is supposed to look at her and be like, well, obviously those things she said about not ruining your life must be dumb if she also says shit like this. Here's my card. You call me when you need me. Cell number is right there. And remember, Allison, Allison needs to think about Allison. You have such exotic eyes. You wouldn't have a little Asian in you, would you? Huh? Not appropriate. Never mind. That's one. I guess that it could also be the case that the point the movie is trying to make here is that it doesn't really matter how good the arguments in favor of abortion are because Marta soon leaves, and when she does, the janitor hits Allison with the only argument that really matters. There's something that M-A-R-T-A didn't tell you, Allison. Your baby. She's a little girl. And this is where we get to the big twist of the movie, because after he tells Allison the gender of her unborn child, she realizes that Marta never actually saw him. Wait a minute. She didn't... See me. How could she not? Who are you? Well, I'm not a ghost. I'm certainly no angel. I'm definitely not. Kind of leaves only one option. Oh, God. You gotta be more careful with that, Allison. You say, oh God, and oh God is what you're gonna get. Okay, not for nothing, but saying that I'm not is totally something that would say. So. But yeah, he reveals that he's actually God come down from the heavens to help Allison make the right decision. And as you can imagine, this is a lot for her to take in. So she does what she should have done 20 minutes ago and runs away from the strange man as fast as she can. And as Allison does her best to make sure she's surrounded by plenty of witnesses, the janitor does what every all-loving god would do in this situation. He follows her inside and menacingly stares at her from across the room. Is there an aid available for room three, please? I didn't get your name before. Okay, I don't care if he is God, he's still creepy as shit. Because that woman, whose name is Lucretia, seems intimately familiar with the clinic, Allison decides to ask her if she knows anything about the maintenance man. Uh, Lucretia? Mm -hmm. Do you know that maintenance man over there? Not that you would, it's just you seem to know people around here, so. Maintenance man. I ain't never met no maintenance man, although my mama tell me my daddy was a maintenance man among other things, if you know what I'm talking about. So you don't know him? Girl, is you high? What you been smoking? And this is kind of where the central conceit of this movie falls apart for me, because, like, does Lucretia really not have any follow-up questions there? Based on everything she's just said, it very much seems like Allison is hallucinating right now. So you'd think that at the very least, Lucretia would make a note of it. Uh, like I know for me personally, if the girl next to me who was clearly in emotional turmoil started asking me questions about a janitor that only she could see, that would definitely pique my interest. Also, not for nothing, but they are currently in a healthcare facility, and after years of apparently getting an abortion every weekend, Lucretia has developed a rapport with the staff, so you think that she'd have no qualms about finding Miss Glow and being like, 
So uh, yeah, I think that girl over there is having a nervous breakdown. Honestly, this one little interaction does make me want to go back and reevaluate the entire movie to see if the way people around Alice interacting holds up knowing what we know now, because I don't think that it does, and that would make it much more enjoyable to watch. Like, she has had full conversations with the god janitors, so does that just mean that she's just been openly talking to herself the whole time? Why, why has nobody said anything? I guess maybe the implication is that this is all happening inside of her head and she just looks like she's sitting quietly to everyone around her, but I honestly don't think that's the case because there's at least one instance where the act of her having a conversation has tangible effects on the world around her. It was because she was talking to the janitor that she ended up dropping her phone. Don't think that this happens if she was just sitting still. Oh, she's gotta turn this whole major thing. Oh, oh my God. Which, while we're on the topic of the phone, at one point the janitor hands it back to her. So like, what's that about? I mean, I guess it all happens from the waist up and we don't really get a super clear shot of it, but I still say that that very much looks like the phone is being handed to her, and if only Allison is able to see the janitor, that would mean that if anyone was looking at her at that moment, she would probably appear to have some form of telekinesis. Despite the fact that Lucretia tells Allison in no uncertain terms that there is no janitor, she still very much thinks that there is a janitor, so she goes over to ask Miss Glow to deal with him. That man over there, uh, the, the janitor, I hate to use that word, but you know what I mean. Um, can you ask, like he just keeps on staring at me, so. Is janitor a rude thing to say? Well, well, what a weird time for this movie to try to be politically correct. Naturally, Miss Glow doesn't see the jan- maintenance workers, so she does her best to handle Allison in the gentlest way she can manage. Is that janitor there? Yes. Yes! <laughs> this is such a relief. <laughs> like, she didn't even know what I was talking about. I mean, it was like she couldn't see him. I mean, how can you not see him? He's standing right there. <gasps> oh my gosh. I'm so relieved. Oh, Miss Glow to the rescue. I bet that's a motto around here. You can always count on Miss Glow. <laughs> Honey, I just get paid to keep things moving here, but I'm not made out of stone. This is very stressful for a girl like you, and, and stress can do some funny things. Can make you see janitors that aren't there. You have the three classic signs of stress. Difficulty breathing, trouble sleeping, and seeing janitors that aren't there. And like, again, the way that everyone is handling this situation is baffling to me. Like, I'm not entirely sure if there's a proper protocol for what to do when someone is hallucinating in the waiting room of an abortion clinic, but at the very least, I feel like Miss Glow should have gotten a doctor by now. Honestly, maybe she should lose her job. Still, Miss Glow is nothing compared to Allison, because the way that she acts in this scene makes absolutely no sense. Ma'am, your janitor is upsetting me, and I would think that someone in your very delicate position would- Allison, honey, there is no janitor. He doesn't come in until nine, and I've never seen him once come in early. I'm sorry, Allison. There's no janitor. Why is she calmly talking to the manager right now? There is literally no version of this situation that shouldn't lead to her having a total freak out. This scene is an example of something I hate in movies, which is where the character is trying to be rational by not believing the insane thing that's happening to them, but then by doing so, they end up convincing themselves of something equally insane. If not more so. Like, Either she's talking to God, which would be weird, or she's not, which would honestly be weirder, because that would mean that a random man has just randomly decided to follow her into the abortion clinic dressed as a janitor, tell her that he's God, 
and try to convince her to keep her baby. And also he has the ability to make himself invisible whenever she tries to point him out to other people. Or again, the most logical explanation for this situation is that she's in the midst of a severe mental break, which is why it's strange that when Allison finally accepts that nobody can see the janitor but her, she seems like... like frazzled? More than anything? Of course. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> I'm seeing janitors that aren't there. I must be so freaked out about this whole thing that I'm seeing a janitor of all things, right? <laughs> I know I'm pretty weird, but um, uh, my boyfriend said he was going to call, so, uh, yeah. Well, you, you think about what I asked you. There's still time. Literally, why are they still talking about her decision? Uh, I feel like I made it pretty clear that I'm pro-choice over the course of this video, but even I feel like she shouldn't be making any decisions until she's gone through at least a 24-hour psych eval. That doesn't happen, though. Instead, Allison just goes back to her seat to talk to the janitor god some more. Or, or, or as everyone else in the clinic would see it, ra ramble to herself in the corner. And I think that this is the first time that she actually believes she's standing face to face with the Almighty. So right now she could ask him about any number of great mysteries of the world. You know, what's the meaning of life? What happens when we die? Are Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster friends? Thankfully though, she doesn't do any of that. And instead she asks him a question that I personally have been wondering for the entire runtime of this movie. Why did he choose to appear to her as a middle-aged male janitor? You don't look how you're supposed to look. Tell me something I didn't hear 2,000 years ago. What's that supposed to mean? Shouldn't have skipped that Sunday. But if you're not impressed, I could, uh... How about something more ancient of days-ish? Or maybe Renaissance painting? No more, please. Janitor looks suddenly working for you? Yeah. Not for me, though. Still not entirely sure why those were your only three options. Like, from what I hear, God is supposed to be a pretty smart guy, so I feel like he should know that there is perhaps no worse disguise he could have chosen to try and connect with a scared teenage girl than that of a middle-aged male janitor. And for the record, that's not because he's a janitor, because... I mean, my god, I hate to use that word. That said, though, the whole middle-aged man of it all does feel like a weird choice, because I can think of no one person on Earth who seems less like they're able to empathize with Allison right now than the person God is currently pretending to be. Although, although I guess that might also be because the person playing him did write and direct a, a, a pro-life Christian movie in real life. So. Honestly, I feel like were God being strategic on this one, he would have posed as someone more like Miss Glow the receptionist. But I feel like the idea of that probably was a non-starter for this movie because one it would mean that the director couldn't fulfill his dream of casting himself as Jesus Christ, and two, it would mean that God would be a woman, which would be blasphemous because everyone knows that God is a boy. Uh, which, like, given how many times I've heard this side argue that gender is determined by one's genitalia, would suggest that according to evangelical canon, God has a penis. Which is weird. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure why he would need one of those. Although that said, it's probably pretty big, right? Unless you forget, this film is set in an active abortion clinic. So while Allison and God are chit chatting, a nurse is calling patients back. Windy May Fong? Yes. 
Am I saying that right? And that's two. And honestly, I feel like just showing you that clip on its own, it doesn't seem that bad, but believe me when I tell you that in the context of the movie and fresh on the heels of that weird Marta moment, the nurse not knowing how to pronounce her name did feel pointed. Uh, like, how are you not going to know how to pronounce Fong? It's, it's four letters. When he sees that woman go into the operating room, God is... Well, he's not happy. Thank you very much. Are you okay? My babies. They're killing my babies. I don't understand. Thousands, thousands and thousands of my babies. If you want proof that Hollywood has a liberal bias, then look no further than the fact that that man did not win an Oscar for that scene you just watched. Heartbreaking stuff. Still, for as undeniably moving as that scene was, it does raise a few questions for me. For starters, if he really cares this much, then why doesn't he just do something about it? Uh, we all saw what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what he's capable of. It would be one thing if God had a rule against intervening in human affairs or something, but like... Clearly he doesn't because his entire movie is literally just him intervening in human affairs. It's just that the way he's going about it feels fairly inefficient. I'm not saying I'd want this to happen, but if God really wanted to prevent abortion, raining fire down onto Planned Parenthoods across the country would be a much more effective way to go about it than dressing up like a janitor and going from knocked up teen to knocked up teen, performatively crying in front of them until they change their mind. Which is another thing. I don't know that I buy those tears, because if abortions really do make God cry, then how come he hasn't been crying this entire time? Uh, like I said, he has been in an active abortion clinic for the entire runtime of this movie. Based on Miss Glow's list from earlier, at least two canonical abortions have occurred over the course of this film that God didn't shed a tear over. And like, those are just the ones we know about. He is, after all, God, so like, isn't he everywhere? Based on the statistics this movie gives, it seems like there's a pretty steady stream of procedures going on at all times, and a being who's omnipotent would know about every last one of them, so it feels weird to me that he'd wait until Wendy Mae Fong to start blubbering like that. Hey guys, Willie who's editing here, and I just want to take a second to say that I'm actually wrong about this while I was re-watching the movie to add clips. I realized that God does actually cry the first time we see a woman go back into the, into the back rooms. Heather? That's me. Thank you. That's the old witch. You can look at me and see if my name was Heather. Ain't no reason why my name can't be Heather. I still say that he probably should have been crying the entire time because, like, there's probably an abortion in Turkey that we're not seeing, but I will admit that uh, the movie kind of won this round, so my apologies. And the selectivity with which he does it isn't the only reason that God crying is weird to me, because the more I think about it, the more I start to wonder why God even cares if babies are killed. Sounds weird saying that out loud, but hear me out. Not to get too heady about this one, but I feel like the reason we as humans view death as this great tragedy is because it comes with a lot of unknowns. We don't know if the people who've died get to continue on existing somewhere else, and we don't know if we ever get to see them again. But like, you know who does know? Fucking God.
And I'm sure there's some great theological explanation for why I'm wrong here, but from where I'm standing, I feel like he shouldn't give two shits about humans dying because he knows where they're going to end up and he knows that they're going to be fine. If, if they've been good. Honestly, if he loves those damn fetuses so much, I feel like he should be happy about abortion because that just means that they can all go up to heaven to chill with him. And before you say anything, yes, I know about purgatory. I was raised Catholic. But one, this movie ain't Catholic. And two, even if it was, I feel like that would just raise more questions because if purgatory bums him out this badly, then like... I don't know, he makes the rules. Why doesn't he just change them? And like, obviously these are all big questions that theologians and philosophers have spent their entire lives struggling with. So know that I'm not actually looking for an answer here. I'm mostly just bringing this stuff up because it's where my mind goes when I watch stuff like this. And it does kind of take me out of the movie a little bit. Still, for all of the complex questions this scene raises, I feel like for me personally, the biggest question is much simpler, and that's how the fuck is this movie still going on? We are currently only about half an hour into a 90 minute movie, and the omnipotent creator of the universe just told our protagonist what she needs to do. I do not understand why Allison still needs another hour to make her choice. Like, I feel like I've made it pretty clear at this point that I'm not a particularly religious person, but that said, if someone that only I could see who demonstrated godlike powers came to me claiming to be god and then they asked me not to do a thing, I probably wouldn't do that thing. Like, I guess at this point he could still be like the devil in disguise or... I don't know, just like a really good magician, but at the very least, Allison seems to believe that he's God, so I feel like she should probably just be like, yep, you're all knowing, and I have proof that you exist now. I guess I'm gonna listen to you. So yeah, while Allison still needs some more time to wrap things up, I feel like I don't. There's much, much, much more of this movie, and I think I could probably talk for like 20 minutes about every line of dialogue that's left, so rather than making a video that's 12 hours long, I figure I can probably just cut things here, especially because like... Well, it's not like you guys don't know where this is going. If, if you don't, then spoilers... She chooses life. That said, there truly is so much more to discuss here. So if you guys like this and would like to see more, then let me know in the comments because I would gladly do a part two of this video. Or if you want to see me talk about a different Christian movie, then let me know which ones because like I said, I would like to keep this series going. I really like talking about this stuff and after making this video, I think I have a better sense as to why. I think that the problem I have with these sorts of movies is the same problem I have with Christianity, is the same problem I have with conservatism in general, and that's that there are a lot of plot holes. And while I may be not so great at engaging with these sorts of plot holes as they affect my life in the real world, I do this sort of shit with movies all the time. It's scary to say, but the kind of thinking that went into the making of this movie is everywhere in our lives, and its impact can be felt all over the place. By engaging with the art that comes from the other side, I feel like we can gain a better understanding of how that side operates. And while that maybe won't necessarily be a step towards fixing things, it could at the very least give us a little better insight into the specific ways that we are all currently fucked. But yeah, that's my video. Please like, please like and subscribe and share and all that fun stuff. Also, speaking of abortion, I just wanted to do a little follow-up. For those of you who keep up with the channel, you know that a few months ago I got drunk and spent $80 to license out a stock photo that I needed to make this shirt. Um, yeah. 
To make up for my losses, I decided to sell them, and then in order to assuage my guilt for potentially profiting off of a joke that was marginally related to abortion, I decided to donate half of my first month's earnings to various abortion charities. I waited a while because I wanted to figure out what I owed in taxes and stuff, and then I honestly kind of forgot about it, but making this video reminded me, so I've since been able to donate $333. Uh, I, I, ironically, that first month, I made $666. But yeah, if you want to, you can still get yourself an I Am Pro Joyce t-shirt. It, it really helps out the channel, especially now that I'm keeping all of the profits for myself. Or if you want to support the channel in other ways, you can always donate to my Patreon or Super Thanks Me, which, speaking of, I do have a few Super Thanks that I need to Super Thanks back. Thank you to Jessica Laudry6522, Devin Hansen, Horstwurst, Yes I Am Please, Kelly L3791, Emma Caroline89, and that's it. I thought there was another one, so I didn't say and, but that's it. And that's all there needs to be. Thank you guys very much. And if you guys can't donate or simply don't want to, I understand, but you can still support the channel by liking and subscribing and sharing and commenting and, I don't know, just watching it. I get ad revenue, so that's cool. But yeah, that's my video. See you guys later. Please, please, please be nice to me in the comments. Not, not, not looking forward to the comments of this one. Welcome back, real fans. It's time for everyone's favorite part of the episode, the part where I pose while my patrons' names scroll. Yeah. Um, so for this one, I feel like I should be confused more than anything i'm going to mention that it's i think the title is going to be this christian movie is the worst argument against abortion i've ever seen so i feel like i should be like hearing an argument and being like what uh, how do i do this with the hat Let's see move this here oh okay it's always hard to edit my hats because they feel like I have dark a dark patch right here. And so when I go to edit it, it I can just do that later. I don't know why I'm telling you, so I just need to be like confused. Like what? What? Huh? Oh, you hate women? What? Um, I need to start thinking about my body shape and the fact that I'm terrible at photoshopping, so the more complicated of a shape I make, the harder it is for me to crop myself out. Um, so, like, I'll just, I'll keep it easy, like, I wish I was better at that one eyebrow thing, like, I can't, I can't do it without closing this eye too much, I'm at the rock. What if I were, though? That'd be weird. Hands are hard. Hands are the hardest part to edit. If I make sure my fingers are separated, it won't be too bad, like... Although I don't know what picture I should use as a background, because it's, it's not a very evocative looking film. It's... It's, um... It's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of just all in a waiting room. Um... I guess there's a part that I didn't show. If I didn't show it, should I? can I still use the thing for the thumbnail? Because there's a part of it that I didn't show. Maybe I'll show the next where, like, he, like, shows Allison 
what her fetus looks like and it's like it would do well as a thumbnail but like i don't want people clicking in and being like where's the cheap cgi fetus i came for well maybe if i talk about it now that counts as me saying it i'm talking about the cheap cgi fetus so here's a clip of the ch I, I won't remember to add that in but i should it's late and I'm kind of scrambling. I went away this weekend, so I'm kind of scrambling to get this video out in time, especially because I didn't put up a video last month because of a copyright claim. It's all just insane. What? What? And then maybe one just prayer hands. I don't know what that looks like. I think I might need to go to bed. So hopefully there's a there's a there's a thumbnail in there somewhere. Frankly, I don't think people are clicking on these videos for my face, so don't think it matters. But uh, thank you, patrons and people who are still watching to this point for some reason. Smooches, good night.